this artwork is called It's in Our Hands. It was created by children in the Ukraine as an entry to the Danube Art Master competition. The children were creating artworks from materials found near water, near the Danube. And really, it's, it's in our hands. This is what I want to talk about today. Thank you for the honor of inviting me to speak here in this beautiful musical city of Vienna, by the banks of the Blue Danube. Very grateful to the European River Restoration Center and the International River Foundation and ICPDR for hosting this fantastic event. I have been a member of the River Restoration Center in the UK since 1997, when I had the opportunity to come over to Denmark and to the UK to see the restoration work done under the EU Life Project on the River Breda in Denmark and the Kohl and the Skurin rivers in the UK, with Moens Nielsen and also with Nigel Holmes. I hear that Nigel very recently passed away, which I'm very sad to hear. May he rest in peace. I went back after that visit to Europe in 1997, inspired with many ideas around urban catchment management and river restoration. At the time, I was working in the urban catchment area and the rivers leading to the lake of Zikufle in Cape Town, which had the dubious distinction of being the most severely hypertrophic lake in the world at that time. I sincerely hope it's no longer top of that list. Today, I want to address the issue of how we can work together from local to global levels, realizing water security for sustainable development. And I will be focusing um, on the policy opportunities in 2015 at the global level, because I firmly believe 2015 is really a historic opportunity, and I hope that the conference declaration coming from all of you from this conference can actually feed in to the discussions and the negotiations taking place at global level next year. Just a very few words about GWP, a growing international network since 1996. We work mainly in the developing regions of the world. We have 13 regional water partnerships, um, which of course includes GWP, Central and Eastern Europe, and I'm very glad to be here today with my colleagues, and thank you for all the work which they've also put into helping to prepare this conference. Um, there are now 86 country water partnerships within the Global Water Partnership, and we have just crossed the benchmark of having more than 3,000 partner organizations joining in 176 countries. This map of the world shows you broadly where the partners are located, with the, the bigger the bubble, the more partners there are in that particular country. So you can see where the partners are concentrated. And I'd very much welcome everyone here, if you belong to an organization, you'd be more than welcome to, to get involved um, with the work and the cooperation that happens within GWP. But I want to start off by asking, what might a water secure world look like? There are many definitions. It's being discussed in many different fora from many different points of view. But it seems to me that a water secure world has to ensure that there is enough water for all, for society, for economic development, and for ecosystems. Given that there's a finite amount of water in the global water cycle, of course, that is becoming a major challenge. A water secure world has to reduce risks of droughts, floods, landslides, and waterborne diseases, all the negative aspects of water. At the same time, we need to ensure there's an improved quality of life for the most vulnerable people, um, and especially women and children who are exposed to water insecurity. And finally, to do this through an integrated approach that's holistic, that's participatory, that recognizes ecosystem values, and works with all sectors of society and stakeholders. Here's a very nice graphic from the World Resources Institute which shows the, most, the 100 uh, most populous river basins in the world. That's why you don't see anything being highlighted in Australia, because this shows the level of stress of those basins um, 
but it's the, uh, the 100 most populous basins. Um, and you can see that certainly in Europe, there is also its share of water stress. Here is a graphic which I thought that you might find interesting from a new project called the Global Dialogue on Water Security and Sustainable Growth, which GWP is running jointly with the OECD. And this graphic clearly shows that we have a divided world in which countries with simple hydrologies and with high investments in water security generally have higher income levels. You can see the income level is represented by the colors of the bubbles in the graph. The x-axis represents the variability of the monthly runoff. And the y-axis represents the investments in water security. And you can see very clearly that of these 20 river basins, no, sorry, these are 100 river basins that are represented, 20 are picked out. Um, which will be the focus of the, of the project. Um, the, more, uh, the more wealthy river basins have a lower monthly variability, so easier hydrologies to deal with, but at the same time they have also invested in their water security. So economists can really help with coming up with some very useful and clear and crisp information that can help us when making our messages to policymakers. Just to put the situation of Europe into a global context, this is a map of the exploitation of hydropower potential, where you can see that Europe has in fact already exploited more than half its hydropower potential. If you look at the, uh, the circle, and the shaded part of the circle. Africa has only barely started to exploit its hydropower potential and the other regions of the world are somewhere in between. Again, I find it's helpful to see the evidence of where we are at this point in time. The world is at a critical juncture. I think we face problems that we have not really been aware of. We haven't seen them coming to a large extent. Um, this is a picture of a river, Villa Lobos, which flows into Lake Akat, sorry, Amatitlan, carrying the effluent and the waste from Guatemala City. And so you can see certainly in terms of river restoration, in terms of protecting ecosystems, we have a tremendously long way to go. But I want to focus most of all in my talk on the implications of climate change and the climatic extremes, which of course you're familiar from the IPCC reports. They're predicting that we should prepare for more frequent and more severe floods and droughts as the global water cycle speeds up as a result of the general warming of the, the global climate. So, um, let's focus a little bit on flood risk management, which has such a close relationship with river restoration projects. Since the dawn of time, people have known that settling on floodplains has enormous advantages. And floodplains generally have the highest GDP per square meter of any land surface anywhere in the world, of course. Um, they're valuable for agriculture, they're valuable for livelihood opportunities and for fisheries. Um, and of course, floodplains are absolutely crucial for recharging and rejuvenating ecosystems, bringing nutrients. But at the same time, floodplains pose enormous risks for the people, for the industries, for the economic activity that's located there. So we need to consider a paradigm shift in terms of moving from defensive and reactive approaches to flood risk management to much more proactive approaches. From ad hoc flood risk management to integrated flood management towards a culture of prevention by managing flood risks and living with floods, realizing that these are likely to be more frequent. 
and balancing flood risk while achieving sustainable development needs at the same time. For all of this, what we really need is a change in the decision-making processes to include risk reduction, to include much more stakeholder participation and risk management approaches that really take into account the multifaceted, wicked problem that flood risk management represents. So we have to look at the economic aspects, legal and institutional aspects, and social aspects and stakeholder involvement, of course, as well as the environmental aspects, in order to have a truly integrated approach. Um, I'm working here with the principles of integrated flood management, of which the first, of course, is around risk management, but just to stress that integrated flood management really relies on the river basin as a planning unit, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with many of these basic principles, so I won't go through this in detail in the interests of time. Um, stakeholder participation is absolutely fundamental, and this is a diagram from the Integrated Flood Management Program that GWP runs jointly together with the World Meteorological Organization. It's crucial to have in the involvement of all the stakeholders in the dialogue and to have an optimal mix of bottom-up and top-down approaches. So here we have really the linkage between the local and the global. It's vital to have that local level experience and input in order to ground truth the approaches that are being followed that the right sort of policy decisions and policy messages can be conveyed. And of course, within all of this, there are trade-offs to be made um, and effective conflict, conflict resolution mechanisms have to be found. Now, probably more for the interests of this conference, what is of great value here is a truly interdisciplinary approach. Um, where a range of scientific domains are involved, from river geomorphology to ecotoxicology to indeed community participation, uh, social science methods for ensuring stakeholder involvement. Um, I mentioned the, the program which we run jointly with the WMO. There's a help desk for integrated flood management, which was established a few years ago, uh, where it's possible to go into the database and actually download a huge amount of information, case studies, concept notes, tools, and so on. Um, while at the same time, it's also possible for countries, for cities, for communities to actually contact the technical support unit and through our support-based partners, which include about 40 organizations with a lot of technical expertise in flood risk management, uh, to actually help to structure projects and develop projects. So the help desk is a demand-driven mechanism, which has already helped about 28 countries, uh, in, mostly in the developing world, to uh, develop flood, flood risk management approaches. I also want to mention that we have recently launched a joint program with WMO on integrated drought management. And of course, drought is, it's not the converse of flood management because it's a very different kind of phenomenon. It's a creeping, slow onset phenomenon. Um, drought really is a stress test for the nexus. Uh, this favorite buzzword which is now coming in, which can encompass the energy, water, and food, can encompass energy, food, water, climate, ecosystems, soils, waste management. I mean, there are many, many nexuses which are being uh, proposed. However, drought certainly tests that nexus because that it's when drought hits that trade-offs really have to be made. So the objective of the Integrated Drought Management Program is to support stakeholders at all levels by providing policy and management guidance and sharing scientific information, knowledge and best practices for integrated drought management. I want to really recognize the work that GWP Central and Eastern Europe has been doing in terms of natural small water retention measures. If you attend the session on Wednesday morning, 
on this topic. Um, you'll get a lot more information about this, but there have been fantastic uh, demonstration projects, work done and papers written um, from work in Poland, Hungary, Slovakia and Slovenia, looking at these natural small water retention measures. So, uh, watch the space on Wednesday. Um, this is an this is a, a advert for that session. Um, I already mentioned the uh, APFM, the Associated Programme on Flood Management, was established in 2001, the Help Desk established in 2009. We also launched a water climate and development programme for Africa called WACDEP Africa, which was launched in 2011 together with the African Union. Um, and the Integrated Drought Management Programme was launched in 2013. There are now five regional drought programmes in Central and Eastern Europe, was the very first one to, to be launched. In fact, before the global programme was launched. So the global programme has been very much informed by the experience from Central and Eastern Europe. Um, GWP uh, in the Horn of Africa and in West Africa, there are now regional programmes that have been launched. A South Asia drought platform together with IMI, the International Water Management Institute, and Central America is the latest region to have launched. Although they generally have problems with uh, hurricanes and excess of water, however, because of the increase in climate variability, they're now experiencing increasing drought as well. Um, and they realize they need to put proactive policies in place to counter droughts in Central America. Just very briefly, the way that our framework conceptually on water security and climate resilience links these areas, that on the basis of a background of better climate information and better climate services, we really need to bring together the three communities on climate adaptation, on disaster risk reduction and water security. And you'd be very surprised how at global level these communities actually don't talk to each other. They organize separately, they have their separate conferences. And G part of GWP's role is we've seen ourselves as, as somehow helping to link water security with the agenda of climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction at national level, at regional level, and at global level. Um, very quickly, the way in which we see conceptually that these things fit together is that um, integrated water resources management gives a basic approach, uh, but a country, each country will also need integrated flood management and integrated drought management plans, and all of these should form part and be mainstreamed into the national adaptation plans that are produced, the NAPs. And we're working with the UNFCCC to provide the water guidance for these national adaptation plans. 2015 really provides a unique opportunity at global level. The Sendai Conference will take place in Japan, the UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, defining a post-2015 framework for disaster risks. At the same time, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's the negotiations on the post-2015 development agenda to negotiate the sustainable development goals. And then, of course, there's going to be COP21 in Paris, where we're all hoping for some sort of binding agreement to emerge. Why is it important to have a dedicated global water goal within the post-2015 agenda? I won't go through this in detail, but just to say that in the Millennium Development Goals, it was water supply and sanitation that took the center stage. Now there's a real opportunity to link the poverty reduction with sustainability. And this is exactly what the SDGs seek to do. And a much more focused approach to water management is fundamental to achieve both those aims, both sustainability and poverty reduction. This is why we see that it's very important um, to have a dedicated water goal and also, as it says in that bottom left-hand corner, splitting water across multiple goals, risks contributing to a silo approach, it risks the ongoing under-representation of water in global and regional policy dialogues. As you know, at European level, water has been shortchanged for some years with uh, respect to our colleague from the European Union, right. Uh, GWP has been very involved with convening national stakeholder consultations in um, 
a number of countries in 29 countries this year and in 22 countries in 2013. Um, this is a snapshot of the countries and the numbers of stakeholders that participated in the stakeholder consultations on the SDGs and on the role of a global water goal in 2014. In Europe, it included consultations in Bulgaria, in Poland, in Romania, and in Slovenia. Um, the reports from these national stakeholder consultations went directly to those countries' missions in New York, and we hope they contributed to the negotiations on the SDGs. You may all be familiar with the actual proposal from the Open Working Group on what is now Goal 6, ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Um, I'd like to just draw your attention to 6.5, the target which calls on all countries to implement integrated water resources management, and the target 6.6 .6 by 2020 to protect and restore water-related ecosystems, which of course is the target that comes straight out of the Aichi biodiversity targets, which have already been negotiated and agreed by all countries. That's why for the other targets, it's 2030 is the target date, but for the ecosystems-related target, it's 2020. And we're very happy to see the inclusion of that. What we weren't so happy about is that there was a target proposed on the water-related disasters, which was proposed to be included here, but in the negotiations it dropped out. And they went and put that target under cities. Now, in fact, of course, it's, as we all know, it's not just cities, it's rural areas which are also hit by water-related disasters. And this is where the Sendai conference becomes very important because Sendai gives an opportunity for the world community to strengthen the post-2015 disaster risk reduction framework by the inclusion of water. Uh, we've been very involved with helping to develop that water brief for Sendai. And this is what the proposed target would, would look like. And we very much hope that you might be able to support this proposal also in the conference declaration, which is why I'm showing it to you. I'd be very happy to, to share it with you in more detail offline if you're interested. Um, and then, of course, there are the de detailed indicators uh, for, for the various areas of the target on disaster risk reduction. Um, and finally, okay. How does river restoration contribute to regaining benefits in river basins and avoiding losses? Through green infrastructure, through natural water retention methods, through better river corridor management, these are all the topics that you're going to be discussing over the next three days. This is why this conference is so vital. And I'd like to leave you with some reflections. What progress has been made in advocating for river restoration? Are you seeing that the message is being heard at wider and wider levels? And I think there is evidence that indeed it is. Which broader stakeholder communities have been engaged? Is there progress in engaging stakeholders in food, in the energy sector, and so on? And how can you and your organization play your part in the this crucial year of 2015 by contributing to possibly the flood and drought risk managements for Sendai, the climate resilience discussions within the run-up to COP21, and finally to the dedicated water goal for sustainable development. Thank you very much for your attention.